Hello, Life Center. My name's Nate Angelo, and I have the privilege of serving on the board here at Life Center. It's so great to be with you today. As uh, you know, we nominated Tyler and Amber Soley to be our next senior pastor several weeks back. Just this week, we had our vote, and our members overwhelmingly approved Tyler and Amber Soley to be our next senior pastor here at Life Center. We are so excited about the days to come. Thank you for your faithfulness, Thank you for leaning in, and brighter days are ahead. Now, will you please join me in welcoming Tyler Soley, our new senior pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. You can, you can be seated this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Merry Christmas. And, uh, you know, today, to be able to stand here uh, is truly an honor. Amber and I and our family were humbled at the opportunity to steward uh, this, this role and this responsibility. And, you know, our church, we are 100 years old. That means for 100 years here in the, the city of Tacoma, we have been a beacon of light with the name of Jesus. And the good news is, since this is his church, should he tarry, that's going to continue for the next hundred years. And so we're confident that the great, great days are in front of us. And so thank you for your love, your support, your prayer for this place. We're going to jump into the message today. In a moment, we're going to look together to Luke chapter 2. And we've been in a series entitled The Keys of Christmas, The Keys to Christmas. And today, we're going to focus in on one of our final keys. But how many of you, uh, your family, you have some traditions that are very valuable to you during the Christmas season? Any, any tradition? People, I know when our kids were young, every year we made this tradition of loading them all in the car. And when I was little, we didn't have to have booster seats for every individual up until like 16 years old or whatever it is now. Uh, but, you know, getting all three kids strapped into booster seats, getting them hot chocolate and putting on Christmas music and we drive around and look at Christmas lights. Any Christmas light people in the house? Okay. This year we decided to start a new Christmas tradition. And so Amber and I and our three kids, we got together and we decided we're going to do Secret Santa. And I know that's funny because there's only five of us, so how secretive can it actually be? But we got together a couple of weeks ago and we all drew names and, you know, of course, one person got their own name, so you had to reshuffle them and everybody draws again. And finally we got it where everybody had a different name. And so we, we made a plan and everybody was going to buy their secret Santa a gift. Well, yesterday we're talking as a family, we're planning, we're strategizing and Amber says to each of our children, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give each of you $10, and today we're going to go to Target, and you need to buy an actual gift with the $10. And one of my children, who will re remain nameless, he's our firstborn, <laughs> he looks at Amber and goes, if I find a gift that's cheap, do I get to keep the money? And I'm sitting there listening to this and I'm going, what's wrong with you? And you are one of the most brilliant people that I know. Like simultaneously, I'm like, I'm kind of like, what are you thinking? And also just encouraged in my heart going, yeah, yeah you're, you're onto something, right? It's interesting how that's not just an issue with our children, it's actually an issue with me. Because often in life, when we, even when we're focused on giving, we can still be consumed with what we get, even in our giving. It's really part of our human nature, isn't it? It's part of our human condition. And even in the season of Christmas, we're, we're focused on presents, we're focused on what can we get, and some of us, we, even as we prepare to give, we think about what's going to come back to us. But here's what I love about this story of Christmas and what we're going to focus in on today is we see something in the arrival of Jesus, that God loved humanity so much that he was willing to give for the sake of giving. I don't know about you, but I want my life to look a little bit more like that. 
And so I want us to look together to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to read a a few verses. We're going to start in verse 8 today. It says this, Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And they were terrified. Now, we've talked about this a number of times. Almost every time you see an angel show up in Scripture, the people are freaked out. Probably for good reason. Especially this night. Why? Because there's not parking lot lights above the shepherds. So imagine you're in the pitch dark, you're out in the fields, maybe some stars giving some light. If you saw the moon last night, it was bright. But all of a sudden, Scripture says that an angel appears among them. Not at a distance, but kind of right there. And the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. So when we hear that they were terrified, probably for good reason, because it would probably freak you out too. And it goes on. It says, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news. Can you say good news? I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. There's a lot in that verse. We're going to come back to it in a minute. He goes on, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us. Can you say us? Which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept these things in her heart and thought about them often. Now look at this, verse 20. And the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. We hear this story and some of us, our our minds go back to Charlie Brown, the Christmas story. You know, when Charlie Brown's asking, what is Christmas all about? And Linus says, well, I'll tell you what it's all about. And he, he quotes from this story. We look at this and we go, what's so significant about what is happening here? Well, the fact that shepherds, by the nature of their occupation, were considered unclean ceremonially unclean. In other words, they couldn't go into the temple courts without going through a purification process. And yet God chose these outsiders. God chose the least likely to be the very first recipients of this good news that was to bring great joy for all people. What also is interesting is these shepherds are watching these flocks there in Bethlehem not too far from Jerusalem. So there's some scholars, some biblical scholars who believe that these shepherds more than likely were guarding a significant flock of sheep, the sheep that were set aside to be offered as sacrifice in the temple. And God shows up to these shepherds, the ones who are guarding the flocks that will be given to atone for the sins of people. But what is the message that God brings to these outsiders? Guess what? There's a greater lamb that has been born today. He is the savior of the world. That's why John the Baptist says, look, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the shepherds, as they hear this news, see, they understand their view socially. They understood that they're seen as one of the lower rungs of the social ladder, but they say with excitement, with urgency, let's go see this thing that the Lord has told us about. See, in these few verses, we're reminded once again that the nature of God 
is that he is passionate about giving. He loves to give. In fact, it's the reason why he sent Jesus. God so loved what? The world that he gave. It's who he is. And this brings us to the next key of Christmas. We've been talking about these different keys, focusing on different components of the arrival of Jesus and what they mean to us. We talked about that we have a God who is with us, not just aware of us. Last week, if you, if you missed Eric's message, you need to listen to it because he talked about what it is to have a crowded heart versus an open heart. And today, we look at this final key of Christmas. And I want us to understand and embrace this because here's this final key. Giving is greater than getting. At the end of the day, we need to understand giving is actually greater than getting. And yet, how often in my life do I focus, do I consume myself with what I can get? In fact, some of us, we've experienced the damage in relationships and friendships and marriages because as an individual, we focus so often on what I can get, not what I can give. Yet what we see in this story and what we see throughout the pages of Scripture is that God is focused on giving, giving. In fact, the Apostle Paul, is he's having this exchange with the group of leaders in Ephesus in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20. The Apostle Paul refers back to a statement that Jesus shared with his disciples. He says this in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Let's say it together. It's more blessed to give than to what? Receive. And some of us, we've heard that phrase. Some of us, we can quote the scripture. But sometimes in my life, maybe you can identify there's a disconnect between what I know and what I practice. I know deep down that it's, it's better for me to give, but often I spend my days focused on what I can receive. But think about this message. God so loved the world that he didn't just put it into words, he demonstrated it. How did he demonstrate it? He didn't just come to a select few people, people that you might think or I might think should have been the first recipients. No, God brought this message to outsiders, to the least likely. And what was that message? Good news. Can you say good news? Great joy. Say great joy. For all mankind. Here's why, here's why there's authority in that last part. He was demonstrating it. This wasn't just for the religious elite. No, this is for the least likelies. It's for everybody. It's for the entire world. God so loved you and I that, that he gave in the demonstration of that. The message shows up to a group of shepherds. See, I think about this idea about how God gives to us. And there's three things that I think are significant about this idea. I want to share those with you this morning. The first is this. This story is not just a story to know, but instead, it's a savior to witness. It's not just a story to know. How many times have I read this story? How many times have I heard this story? How many times have I preached this story? And if I'm not careful, it becomes information that I know, but even in the announcement to these shepherds, it wasn't just about information. Do we recognize there's a big difference between information and transformation? Right. And God wasn't just giving information to a group of people. He was wanting to bring transformation to a world. And the same is true for you and I. We need to be careful not to just leave this as a story tucked away where it's just data somewhere in our minds, but instead, can we allow this story to awaken a sense of awe and wonder in a fresh way in our lives? In other words, where we, like the shepherds, go on a fresh pursuit. I want you to think about that night that the shepherds, they get this message, and where are they sent? They're sent to this little village called Bethlehem. Not too many people live there. But the angel gave some specifics. Did you notice it? This will be the sign. You're going to find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now, 
the challenge is there's probably going to be multiple babies. So how do they know they got the right one? He will be what? Lying in a manger. I want you to think about this for a moment. The king of the universe. The God who spoke everything we know into existence with mere words. Clothed himself in humanity and was born and was laid in an animal feeding trough. These shepherds, they they knew what a manger was. They knew how how the animals would be taken care of. And now they're, they're going, they're searching through Bethlehem. They probably had to search a few different places in order to find Jesus. See, I think about their intentionality, the steps that they were willing to take, the the distance, the journey that they were willing to engage in, all to what? Not just find out information, but to experience a Savior. To them, it wasn't just a story. It was a Savior to experience. And friends, if, if this is a familiar story to you, can I encourage you to maybe in this season, pause for a moment. Come back to this place where we consider God clothing himself in humanity. That it's not just a story that we keep tucked away for once a year, but instead, here's why this is so significant. Without this baby, there is no cross. And if there's no cross, there's no grace. And if there's no grace, there's no rescue. And if there's no rescue, there's no salvation. If there's no salvation, there's no promise of freedom or eternity. So it's significant that we come back to this place. Why? Because it's a Savior that we're called to witness. May we never allow ourselves to become a church that loses its sense of awe and wonder. That it's not just a a collection of information, but no, it is a Savior. His name is Jesus, and we are experiencing him. We witness him. We pursue him. We come back to this place of understanding how great God's love is for us. See, not only is it a savior to witness, as we recognize in the story, but it's important to recognize as well that it's for all. Can you say all? It's for all. It's for all. What does this mean? It it means those who feel like they're on the inside and those who feel like they're on the outside. If you've ever felt like the least likely, guess what? You're in good company with the shepherds. You're in good company. Why? Because God specializes not just in reaching the elite. God is demonstrating that he came to reach all mankind. You see, if I'm God, I would probably put together a plan of announcing this arrival a little bit differently than his plan. I mean, wouldn't you go to the most influential Wouldn't you go to those who kind of had the greatest leadership platform? And so if I'm God, I'm thinking, okay, who do I need to announce this to first? I'm going to go to the high priest. I'm going to go to the the priest in the temple. I'm going to go to the kind of the who's who in Jerusalem. You know, the people who have the most social media following. But what does God do? No, God goes to a group of people with flip phones. Come on, how many of you wish flip phones could come back? Yeah. <laughs> he, goes, he goes to the shepherds, the least likelies. He said, I'm going to show you that these are more than just words. I came to rescue the world. Not just the religious elite, but all mankind. This is good news for all mankind. It will bring great Joy. So it's not just for the insiders, it's for the outsiders. And here's why this is such good news. Has anybody else ever had a bad day besides me? Okay, there's more people in this service than last service, okay. See, this is why this is such good news. Because of the arrival of Jesus, we're reminded our bad days are never so bad that we're outside of the reach of his grace. If he can reach a group of shepherds guarding their flock, guess what? It doesn't matter how far you feel like you're from God, he can reach to where you are today. So if you've ever had a bad day, good news, your bad day will never be so bad that God can't reach you. 
But guess what else? Your good day will never be so good that you don't need his reach. It's for all of us. It's for all, we, we never get to a place where we go, you know what, that grace thing, I've kind of graduated from that. I've got to figure it out. If you ever find somebody like that, run. Because none of us have got this thing figured out. We never become grace graduates. And that's why the arrival of Jesus for all mankind is so important because whether you feel like God has forgotten about you or God looks at you and says, there's no way, he's for you. He came for you. His plan of good news that brings great joy is for all. Here's where this brings us. See, this third thought that I have is this. This good news, it it doesn't just come to me, it needs to also work through me. It doesn't just come to me, it, it needs to work through me. See, the beautiful announcement to the shepherds, did you notice how they respond? They say, let's go this, see this thing that God has told us about. In other words, it's personal. Aren't you thankful that God sees you as a person, an individual? He knows you. He knows you by name. In fact, scripture says he knows the number of hairs on your head or the lack thereof. He, he's got it all figured out. He's got it all figured out. And listen to what Scripture reminds us in 1 John. 1 John, it says this, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. So what is this news that comes to us? It is personal. Can you say personal? But at the end of the day, even though it comes to me, it can't just stop with me. It comes to me, but it also must work through me. It's personal, yes, but it's also missional. In other words, instead of just spending my life on what I can get, I'm now freed up because of this grace to focus on what I can give. In other words, what would it look like if we lived as conduits and not just consumers? What would it look like if we lived dispensing instead of just receiving and hoarding? What would it look like to actually be people who have received, yes, but we give, we give, we give. It comes to me, but it can't just stop there. See, the shepherds, they they hear this news It comes to them, they they go on this pursuit, they don't just know information about the Savior, they experience him. And then if you notice in the scripture, what do they do? They begin to tell all these people. In other words, this good news came to them, but it also began to work through them. Man, that's my prayer for us. That in this season, it wouldn't just stop with us, It wouldn't just sit with us where we, fi- we fi- find ourselves looking at our condition going, well, I'm okay, and I'm okay with that. That we're not just focused on giving so that we can get, but we're focused on giving so that we can just simply look like our God. Giving is greater than getting. I think it's important for us as followers of Jesus To come back to this place. Come back to a place of awe. Come back to a place of wonder. Maybe it's been a while since you found yourself at at a point of wonder in your life. See, to you, maybe maybe it's become about the routine and and the checklist. And, well, yeah, I know that story. And so where are you going to take it this time? But what what if it was actually an opportunity once again to, to engage with Jesus in a fresh way. See, as I was studying and praying this week, I found myself singing a Christmas song. And what I love about this song is it's more than just a Christmas song, it's actually a worship song. See, today, what, what if we focused on what we could give back to God? Often, We show up and and we know that God wants to give to us so we're focused on receiving from him. But what if we just took the next few minutes and just offered him something? See, there's this 
song that says these simple words, oh, come let us adore him. Can I invite us, even where we're sitting today, can this be kind of a journey like the shepherds took where in our hearts we begin to journey towards the manger and we find ourselves in awe and adoration just singing these words. Can you sing it with me, O come? O come let us adore him. O come let us adore Another verse, we'll give you all the glory. We'll give you all the glory. We'll give you all the glory. For he alone is worthy. For he alone. Jesus, you alone are worthy. what I love about worship. What is it that we can actually offer to God? What is it that we can actually give? Does does he need our, our money? Does he need this or that? No. What we can offer is our heart, our worship, our adoration, our wonder, that sense of awe. Can I invite you over the coming days as you gather with friends, family, loved ones, to make sure that you take some time to come back to this place. That it doesn't just remain a a story or or information, but no, this, this good news is designed to bring transformation in our lives. See, today we have the hope of walking out of here with great joy. Why? Because we have it all together? No. Because God loved you and I so much that he gave. And because he gave, we can spend our lives giving in return. Can I invite you to bow your heads with me this morning? I wanna pray for something specific and then we're going to receive our one day offering. But today, across this room with heads bowed or maybe you're watching online, you think about this idea that God Gave. Maybe you're at this place where you recognize today, I need to receive this gift. I need to receive that hope. I need to receive that promise of new life. You see, the good news is that God so loved you and I that he gave his one and only son. That whoever would believe, in other words, whoever would trust in him would not perish. They get to experience forgiveness. They get to experience new life. And so across this room, that's you, would you simply raise a hand if you would say, today, God, I put my trust in you. I want to be made new. I want to receive this gift that you have for me. If that's you, would you just simply raise a hand and hold it up for a moment and say, yeah, that's me. That's me. Pray for me today. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you in the balcony. Yeah. Can we pray this prayer together as the church out loud? Would you repeat after me? Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. I put my trust in you. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new creation. Help me to follow you every single day. Thank you for this gift you've given. And help me to live my life as somebody who gives in response to all that you've given to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we celebrate all those who made that decision today?